For two decades between 1788 and 1808, Maria Luisa of Parma was Queen Consort of Spain. Yet, dark accusations abounded during her life, from serial infidelity to poisoning her enemies. Whether any of these rumours were true remains a source of debate today, but in any case, she was extremely unpopular in her country. Join me as we explore her life. Maria Luisa of Parma was born on the 9th of December 1751 in the city of Parma in northern Italy. At the time, Italy was divided into numerous small states, and in 1748, the Duchy of Parma had been awarded to the Royal House of Bourbon. This was thanks to the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, which brought the War of Austrian Succession to an end. Different branches of the Bourbons ruled France and Spain, and it was determined that Maria Louise's father, Philip, the second son of King Philip V of Spain, would acquire the dukedom. Thus, Maria was born in the Italian city, just over two years after her father had arrived there as Duke of Parma. Maria Louise's mother was Louise Elizabeth, the eldest daughter of King Louis XV of France. She was closely related to Philip, whom she married in 1739, continuing a tradition of marriage between near cousins amongst Europe's royal families. She and Philip had three children who lived into their adult years. Isabella was born in 1741, not long after they were married. Ten years later, in January 1751, a boy Ferdinand was born. Just a few weeks later, Louise Elizabeth fell pregnant, and saw Maria Louise was born 11 months later. The three children and their parents lived in the Ducal Palace of Colour, now in Parma, a fine edifice which had been refurbished and expanded into an 18th century palace from an imposing medieval edifice several decades earlier. Maria Luisa and her two siblings were alleged to have been educated by Etienne Bonnard de Condillac, a prominent French Enlightenment scholar, but there is no evidence to substantiate this. Well, Condillac is known to have arrived in Parma in 1768, and by then, Maria Luisa had already left Italy. Before that, the family had experienced some tragedy, when Maria Luisa's mother died in 1759, followed by her sister Isabella in 1763. Both were claimed by smallpox, the deadliest disease of early modern Europe. Smallpox would greatly change Europe's history, and also the world's, and if you don't want your world to be forgotten, then you need to check out today's sponsor, World Anvil. If you haven't heard of World Anvil, it is an incredible suite of creative tools for game masters, players, fantasy sci-fi authors, storytellers, and anyone who loves world building. Their tools include a world building suite, an RPG campaign manager, and a novel writing and publishing tool. Also, it has a ton of great features for you to make the most of, from interactive maps and family trees, to timelines and automatic linking that will help you create a rich, engaging world for your game, novel, or series. World Anvil boasts a novel planner and writing software, with drag and drop scenes and chapters, as well as publishing subscription and monetization features. It has all the best tools to help you write, organize, and publish your settings with complex characters. Write, world build, and manage your story, all in a single platform. Make sure to check out World Anvil and get 51% off any premium subscription with my code FORGOTTEN. Now back to the video. By the time Maria Louise's mother died in 1759, there had already been considerable thought given to who she would marry, with Prince Louis, Duke of Burgundy in France, considered as a possible match. Yet, he died of tuberculosis in 1761, when he was just nine. Thereafter, a marriage to Prince Charles, the son and heir of King Charles III of Spain, was proposed. Negotiations followed, and on the 4th of September 1765, the marriage was consecrated at La Granja Palace near Segovia, north of Madrid. Maria Luisa was just 13 years old, while Charles was 16, and the pair were first cousins. 
The marriage was a difficult one in its early years for Maria Luisa. Charles's mother, Maria Amelia, had died some years earlier, and with Charles as heir to the Spanish throne, Maria Luisa became the first lady of the Spanish court. Several of her relatives, though, took a dislike to her, in large part owing to her perceived domineering attitude towards her husband, an impressionable young man who never emerged as a strong heir or ruler. Maria Luisa's marriage did not result in children for several years, and when it did, it was overshadowed by miscarriages and the death of several of her and Charles's children. This was not an uncommon development. Infant and child mortality were extremely high in early modern times, with 30 to 35% of children dying before they reached their 10th year. Furthermore, infant and child mortality was especially severe amongst some of Europe's royal lines, a product of the close intermarriage of the royal houses. Queen Anne of Britain, for instance, had been pregnant 14 times in the late 17th century, and had lost all of her children through miscarriages, or death in infancy or childhood. Marie Louisa was slightly better off than Anne. She is believed to have experienced 24 different pregnancies. 10 of these resulted in miscarriages, but 14 went to full term. Of the 14 children that she gave birth to, seven would survive to become adults. Seven others died in infancy or childhood, and owing to this, gossip started to circulate at the Spanish court that Maria Luisa was cursed. Her and Charles's firstborn, a boy named Charles Clemente, born in September 1771, died when just two and a half years old in March 1774. A daughter named Maria Luisa after her mother died at four and a half years in the summer of 1782. Twins named Charles and Philip, or Carlos and Felipe to use the Hispanic versions of their names, were born in September 1783, but they were sickly from birth, and both died within three and a half weeks of each other in 1784. The seven children who lived into their adult years were Carlotta born in 1775, Maria Amelia born in 1779, Maria Luisa born in 1782, Ferdinand born in 1784, Carlos born in 1788, Maria Isabel born in 1789, and Francisco born in 1794. Several of these would become kings and queens of various European states. Curiously, Maria Luisa is understood to have experienced a miscarriage as late as 1799, by which time she was into her late 40s and might have been expected to be post-menopause. By then, her torturous natal history had taken its toll. Though noted as being an attractive woman in the 1770s when she was in her 20s, by the 1780s, Maria Louise was prematurely aged, with many noticing that there was a jaundiced yellow tinge to her skin by her 30s, a product perhaps of her seemingly endless pregnancies and many miscarriages. Maria Louise's father-in-law, King Charles III, died in the winter of 1788, and her husband succeeded as King Charles IV. He would rule for the next 20 years. Maria Louise became queen consort in tandem. She was soon understood to be a major figure behind the throne. Her husband was not a strong ruler, and was imposed upon by his wife. For instance, she attended the first meeting with the senior councillors of state in 1788, and made it clear that she intended to play a role in the governance of the country, something which continued throughout the reign. Charles was content to allow this, as his passions primarily lay in hunting, and other leisurely pursuits of the aristocracy. For her part, Maria Luisa played a much greater role in state affairs, and in particular in promoting education and culture in Spain. Also, she was the primary patron of Francisco Goya, who became the official court painter in the 1790s. During Maria Luisa's life at court, there were endless accusations whispered behind closed doors that she engaged in serial infidelity, taking many different lovers. One specific rumour alleged that she was having an affair with Manuel de Godoy, a young man who in the 1790s 
rose to become the Prime Minister of Spain as Secretary of State. His youth quick rise to power and patronage by the Queen, along with his close relationship with her, gave rise to intense suspicions that the two were engaged in a romance over many years. Furthermore, Maria Luisa relied on Godoy emotionally through turbulent times, such as when she lost her children and the depression caused by her menopause. Godoy was also rumoured to be the biological father of several of her children, and the Queen's confessor wrote in his last will that none, none of her sons and daughters, none was of the legitimate marriage. Although many historians think that the relationship was likely, we actually have very little concrete evidence that confirms this. These accusations seem to have been so prevalent owing to the jealousy amongst Godoy's rivals for power, and because the Queen was exceeding the constraints which were imposed on women in a male-dominated world. The malicious rumour mill also extended to Maria Luisa's relationships with several other senior female aristocrats at the Spanish court. For example, it was suspected that she had poisoned Maria Cayetana de Silva, 13th Duchess of Alba. The Duchess of Alba had married the Marquis of Villafranca, and this union of two prominent Spanish aristocratic lines had made them extremely senior at the Spanish royal court, second only to the royal family and the House of Osuna. Maria Luisa was seen as a rival to both the Duchess of Alba and Osuna as a result. Thus, when the Duchess of Alba suddenly died in the summer of 1802, at just 40 years of age, her passing was viewed as suspicious, and accusations that the Queen had organised for her rival to be poisoned circulated. These allegations were completely spurious, and nearly all historians agree that Alba died from tuberculosis, complicated by severe fever. Nevertheless, this wasn't the only woman Maria Luisa was rumoured to have poisoned. In 1802, her son, Prince Ferdinand, married Maria Antonia of Naples in Sicily. Maria Luisa disliked her daughter-in-law, once writing to Manuel Godoy, What shall we do with that diabolical serpent of my daughter-in-law, and that cowardly mongrel of a son of mine? The animosity between the two, and the fact that she was just 21 led to accusations that she was poisoned, but there is no evidence to support this, and Maria Antonia actually died from tuberculosis. By the 1800s, those at the centre of power in Spain had greater issues to worry about than the perceived infidelities of the Queen Consort, or a fabricated story about a possible poisoning. A much more real and tangible threat had emerged in Western Europe. In 1789, the French Revolution had begun, leading eventually in the early 1790s to the deposition and execution of King Louis XVI of France, Maria Louise's cousin. In the French Revolutionary Wars which followed, King Charles and his government had understandably joined an anti-French coalition, along with Britain and Austria against the French. But when the French began to gain the upper hand over their enemies in 1794, Charles, Maria Luisa, Godoy, and others in charge in Madrid surprisingly changed course. An alliance was entered into with the new French Republic, one which saw Spain become France's foremost ally amongst the European powers. The Franco-Spanish alliance was always an uneven one. Spain was a second-tier power in Europe by the late 18th century, and France was ascendant as the dominant continental power under the Republic. But this became even more acute under Napoleon Bonaparte as Emperor of the French from 1804 onwards. In 1807, Maria Luisa, Charles and Godoy attempted to take advantage of French expansion by agreeing to the Treaty of Fontainebleau, which would allow Spain to effectively invade and annex Portugal, a power which was closely allied to France's main enemy, Britain. What followed was a period of pronounced intervention in Spanish affairs by the French, culminating eventually in the deposition of Charles and the brief accession as king Charles and Maria Luisa's eldest son, Ferdinand, a figure who had become increasingly opposed to his weak-willed father over the years. Maria Luisa and Charles appealed to Napoleon about this new arrangement, 
but their protestations had an even worse outcome when Napoleon decided to dispense with the Spanish royal family altogether. In the summer of 1808, he imposed his brother Joseph Bonaparte as the new King of Spain. With this, Maria Luisa's time at the centre of power in Madrid came to an end, though the new arrangement was a disaster for Napoleon, with a long-running guerrilla war breaking out in Spain, one which swallowed up so many French resources in the late 1800s and early 1810s that it became known as the Spanish Ulcer. With Charles's abdication and then the deposition of Ferdinand in favour of Joseph in 1808, Maria Luisa, her husband and Godoy left Spain and spent much of the late 1800s and early 1810s as quasi-prisoners in France. They lived in pleasant conditions in Aix-en-Provence and in Marseille, but they were under a form of political detention at the same time, to prevent them becoming a source of political discontent should they return to Spain. In 1812, the former king and queen and their followers were allowed to relocate to Italy, where they lived for a time in Rome, under the patronage of the papacy. Events were shifting rapidly by then, and as Napoleon's empire crumbled in the mid-1810s, following a disastrous military invasion of Russia, Ferdinand returned to Spain and reclaimed the throne there. He prohibited his parents from returning to Madrid, Thus, Maria Luisa and her husband spent their remaining years living in Rome. It was a hardly unpleasant retirement, one spent as close confidants of the papacy and amassing a valuable art collection. She died in the Eternal City on the 2nd of January 1819 at 67 years of age. Charles died just two and a half weeks later. Godoy, meanwhile, would live for over three decades longer. Maria Luisa had named him as a primary beneficiary of her will, and Charles had quickly asked him to vacate their court in exile after her death. Perhaps the rumours were true after all. We may never know for sure. Thank you so much everyone for watching this video on Maria Luisa of Palma. I hope you found it interesting. Let me know what you thought of her life down below in the comments, and if you have any other suggestions, also be sure to leave them in the comments. I've recently made it to 300k subscribers, so thanks to all of you who made that possible, and I hope you guys have notifications turned on and are subscribed to get all my videos as soon as I upload them. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.